I am delighted today to be joined by Tom DiLorenzo. What a thrill to be able to feature a conversation with Tom on his brand new book, The Problem with Socialism. Tom, of course, as you know, is the author of many books, most notoriously perhaps The Real Lincoln, also Lincoln Unmasked, How Capitalism Saved America, and Hamilton's Curse, among many others. Tom, of course, also is a professor of economics at Loyola University in Maryland. Tom, welcome back to the show. Pleased to be with you, Tom. Why a book on socialism now in 2016? Uh, Well, there was an opinion poll that I read about that said that 69% of the millennial generation that was polled thought that it would be a good idea to have a socialist as president. And, of course, there's the Bernie Sanders phenomenon where hundreds of thousands of mostly young people became infatuated with his promises of socialism. And so I've got to thinking that, uh, you know, the younger generation never lived through the Cold War and all the controversies over socialism like us old timers did. And they certainly aren't taught much about it in school. And so I think the time is right and it's very important to write a book that's very easy to understand, but yet has uh, is well documented and scholarly and a couple hundred footnotes in there. Uh, that explains all aspects of socialism and why it would be a disaster for the economic future of the millennial generation to go further down the road of socialism. The second chapter is called Why Socialism is Always and Everywhere an Economic Disaster. And I just lay out in as straightforward language as I can the various problems with socialism. And one is the incentive problem. No one has an incentive to work if, if there's no link between effort and reward. And then there's what Friedrich Hayek called the knowledge problem, the idea that what really makes an economy work is all the dispersed knowledge in the minds of millions of people. And then there's the calculation problem, the problem of how to decide how to produce things when you don't have market prices determined by supply and demand. And so basically, if you don't have a market feedback mechanism that rewards good consumer service with profits and then penalizes bad service, uh, you know, high prices or low quality products with losses, then you're just going to have economic chaos. And I talk about the Soviet Union and Latin American countries that have failed, the African countries that adopted socialism right up to the present day with Venezuela being the, the latest example of an economic implosion. Waiting for hours, hoping that by the time one hands in their allotted number, there'll still be food left. So what are the kinds of things that basically everybody runs into in school or at work, when you're talking to people about capitalism, they have all these misconceptions. And what are some of them and how do you answer them? One of the things I did is I looked at the websites of Democratic Socialists of America and the oh. Socialist Party oh, of smart. USA. See, you know, what are, the, what are the people who are proud socialists saying about this? And, and one of the very first things they always say is the problem with capitalism is that they put profits before people. Right. They're only interested in profits and not people. And of course, the fundamental error in that is that in a free market, no business person can make money without serving the people. You know, whether that's customer service is how you make money. You serve the customer and the customer serves you by giving him or her their money. And so it's a basic fundamental falsehood that you can make money in a free market economy by ignoring the people and just going after profits. Another one is in some version of the subsistence theory of wages that under capitalism, the working class will be stuck at the bottom and they they can't go anywhere. And only the rich, the one percenters thrive from that. Well, when you think about it, the only really recipe for the working class being stuck somewhere is either socialism itself or the welfare state. Go on welfare and stay there for several generations and you're going to be at subsistence level of living for a long, long time. Only the market can provide you with economic opportunities that can get you out of a situation like that. And so the socialists are exactly the opposite of the truth when they criticize market as being enemies of uh, the working class and socialism being their friend. It's exactly the opposite of the truth. And those are, those are two of them that I, uh, that I touch upon in this uh, last chapter. Tom, how do you answer this argument from the socialists? They'll say that the freedom that we're talking about as libertarians is really a sham freedom because in a market society, it's nothing other than what they call, as you know, the freedom to starve. Sure, you have freedom. You don't have to take that job with that abusive employer, but uh, you know, good luck getting food down your throat. How do you answer that? Is it a sham freedom? No, I don't think it is. Nothing in the world has reduced poverty more than capitalist economic growth, certainly much more than the welfare state. 
I have a chapter on how the welfare state harms the poor in that it has grossly crowded out all the many thousands of private charitable efforts that used to exist in America and elsewhere because people take this attitude that why should I give money or why should I donate my time to help the people in my neighborhood who are in need? The government will do it. The government. Why should I educate my own children? The government is doing that. Oh, the government can. And so people tend to withdraw from these things, in both, both in their donations of money and in their time. And we've done a great deal of harm with that. I cite Charles Murray's book, In Pursuit, that documents whenever we have periods of faster economic growth, Americans donate many billions of dollars more to charity to help our, our fellow man. And, of course, we create a lot of jobs and opportunity. And so the welfare state not only traps people in horrible public housing projects where crime is rampant and the police do little or nothing about it, but it destroys a lot of the private efforts that once existed that are much more effective to help people out. And so uh, that's one of the things I, I, I would use in my book that would address that question. You have a chapter in here on the Federal Reserve. Explain how you could plausibly fit what the Fed does into a book whose theme is socialism. Very easily, because, you know, uh, to the extent that Hayek's definition of how socialists redefine their tactics by relying more on the welfare state and the progressive income tax, he said, you know, egalitarianism was always the goal. You know, redistributionism and and equality of material goods was always the goal, but the means changed. Means changed from taking over industries to the welfare state and the progressive income tax. And the Fed is one of the major funding forces of the whole shebang, of the whole welfare state. That's why the members of Congress that you see, especially on the Democratic side, are such rabid defenders of the whole Fed banking complex. That's what finances all of their welfare state programs. I've been an economics student since I was 18 years old, and I've always been taught and I've been teaching that price controls are a bad idea for for many reasons. But, you know, what else does the Fed do but try to impose price controls on interest rates? And that's really is, is a version of central planning that we used to criticize the Soviets about, but we employ many of the same techniques. Nationalization of credits was one of the top planks in the Communist Manifesto, and also with the Nazi Party platform of 1925. So whether you're talking about the fascist version of socialism or the communist version, the Soviet version, they all placed a high priority on the nationalization of the money supply. And that's what we've got. All right, Tom, let's talk about the Nazis for a minute. They say that even though we know that the Nazi party was called National Socialist, nevertheless, uh, in practice, they still had private property. In, In practice, it was more or less a market economy. So... What do you say to that? How do you how do you deal with the socialism of national socialism? I quote Hayek is showing that all the famous fascists would be started out as socialists for one thing, and they just said that you know we have a unique brand of socialism. We're going to call it national socialism as opposed to international socialism. And of course, you know a real free market economy in a real free market economy, the consumer is king. One of my favorite quotes from Human Action by Ludwig von Mises is, is in his chapter on the market. He says, on the outside, it looks as though the businessman and the banker is in charge of deciding what gets produced, but it's really the consumer, and the consumer has whims and rapid changes in his or her preferences, and you know, you can be rich one day and poor the next day thanks to the consumer. But under, under fascism, under economic fascism, it was the government that determined what was to be produced and how it was to be produced and you know, the labor relations you're going to have and who you can hire and everything else. And so, yes, they allowed some degree of private property, but it was very heavily regimented and controlled. And besides that, in real fascism in Germany, they did nationalize over half of the entire economy. And then the other half was so heavily regulated and regimented that it was de facto nationalized. And so there were there was no semblance to a free market in Nazi Germany at all. And Mussolini did much of the same thing in Italy during the same period of time. And so I think it's uh, disingenuous, if not absurd, to call uh, Nazi Germany a free market economy or a capitalistic economy for those reasons. What about the Scandinavian objection? Aren't they all happy in Sweden, Tom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a chapter on the myth of scan- uh, successful Scandinavian socialism. 
if you study, a, you know, read up a little bit about, about what's been going on in Sweden, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, Sweden was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And they had all these great inventors. They, you know, Alfred Nobel invented dynamite, and uh, they had Saab and Volvo and, and a lot of other very successful companies. And then the socialists took over the government in the 1950s, and they began basically eating up all the capital with very heavy taxation it was created by these earlier generations of entrepreneurs who were allowed to limp along, you know, throughout the successive decades. But Sweden destroyed its economy eventually to such an extent that not too long ago, 10 to 15 years ago, they had 500 percent interest rates in Sweden because they inflated the currency to try to bail out their big socialist welfare state. And so Sweden was forced to cut back, privatize some industries. They even started privatizing sections of healthcare, and, and they made a, a bit of a comeback, and their economy became a little more prosperous. But still, the per capita income in Sweden is still below that of Mississippi, which is the poorest state in America. So when Bernie Sanders or anybody else points to Sweden, they're really spreading a falsehood. The, the only reason Sweden has improved in recent years was cutbacks in government. And the Swedish president, by the way, uh, is out there denying that Sweden is a socialist country anymore. The book is The Problem with Socialism. And the government can cause they mix it up with lies and make it all day. 